Laura, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to talk about this topic of religious yeah. trauma and the uh, many intersections of it. And that's kind of where I'm all, one of the things I'm really interested. You've mm -hmm. um, just from looking at kind of what you're doing on social media and some of your own sources, you see religious trauma showing up in other areas. That's going to make for a really mm -hmm. interesting conversation. So can't wait to get on. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's such a delight to be here. I just want to start off with just the topic of religious trauma. When I first heard the term religious trauma, kind of when I was starting to deconstruct years ago, um, I felt like it was a bit of an overreaction. Like I was like, okay, that sounds a little like a little much. Like I know that there's some people who have experienced, you know, abuse at the hands of specific people. But um, mm -hmm. as someone who, and as our listeners know, came from a, a really good church experience um, mm -hmm. with no, you know, people, no abusive people, I was, mm -hmm. I, when I heard religious trauma, I thought, oh, that's, that sounds a little ridiculous. Like, let's not make something bigger than it is. And I've come mm -hmm. now to realize that that's not the case. But could you talk to us a little bit about why religious trauma is a real thing? Yeah. So, it's funny because when people ask me like what it even is, what is religious trauma, I usually say religious trauma is trauma. That's important because um, it lives in our bodies and needs to be resolved in our bodies the same way that trauma would from war or from being, mm. you know, uh, like a developmental trauma situation, childhood abuse and neglect, things like that. The word religious just helps us further understand the context where the trauma came from, you know, kind of gives us some context of the situation. It is the way that our body and our nervous system responds to that. And so just like there's subjectivity in other areas of trauma. You know, some people experience a car accident and they walk away relatively unscathed where somebody else might walk, walk away with a lot of fear of driving on, you know, this type of road or behind this type of car. And so we know that trauma is highly subjective. And so that applies to all situations that may result in trauma, which truly could be anything. Um, but we do see that trauma often results from anything that's too much, too fast, too soon, that overwhelms our ability to cope and come back to a place of safety. And that could really be anything. And in the context of religious trauma, that's often doctrines and teachings, experiences in the church, uh, practices, maybe relationships, whether that's with parents or clergy. We see certain doctrines um, unto themselves are not traumatic, but the way that people's bodies and nervous system responds to that uh, can result in trauma and or other physical and mental health uh, mm -hmm. disorder. And so it's important to know that because there are many people, like you said, that are coming out of these contexts and are like, oh, that's not that big of a deal. Or they'll say, this thing, like clergy sexual abuse, that did not happen to me. I don't know right. anybody who that happened. Um, so I didn't experience religious trauma. And there's a lot of confusion there because maybe their body is giving other signals that would indicate some sort of mental health disorder, even trauma. And and so that helps us bridge the gap to realize like, oh yeah, you didn't have to just have this really big thing happen to you in order for your body to log that as trauma. It really could be anything. And especially when we're looking at the ongoing consistent nature of high control religion, where there's always these teachers Teachings. We're going to church seven times a week. You know, it feels <laughs> relatively inescapable. Um, that lands in a person's body in very particular ways and truly can then result in trauma. And it's important to just understand what that is so that people can accurately name what's happening as well as get the support that they need in an effective yeah. way. I wonder if like it might be helpful to to talk about the difference between trauma and then abuse. Cause I, I yeah. wonder if that's why, cause I, I had the same experience, right? I was like, I haven't really, no one's done something to me, you know, like mm -hmm. I not actively, like I don't have these, and we, cause we get these emails, we get hundreds, thousands of emails from people. Yes. And I'm sure you do too, right? Like yes. all these emails, these stories, I'm like, gosh, like I haven't experienced that. How, what well, I don't have the right to say that like I have trauma, <laughs> you know, cause mm -hmm. like no one did something to yes. me. So I'm just yeah. curious if you could talk about that for a second, like the, the difference between those two. Yeah. So a few moments ago, I made the statement that trauma is not the thing that happens to us. It's the way that our body and nervous system responds to the thing that happens mm -hmm. to us. The thing could be abuse. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so that could be anything from like a clergy sexual abuse to being exposed to very extreme practices, hearing really scary sermons. Um, But abuse does not necessarily mean that you will have trauma. It could Mm -hmm. result in a whole bunch of other things. It could result in relational difficulties. It could result in social phobias. It could result in difficulty with boundaries and things like that. Trauma is not guaranteed. It's one of many outcomes. And so we often, and this is a colloquial thing, this goes far beyond religious trauma. We often conflate the thing that happened to me equals trauma. And that's where I think it's really important for people to know, no, like that's very subjective. I think about, you know, I grew up in a high control religion. I have siblings who also grew up in the same high control religion with the same parents, hearing the same thing. And my experience of that is very different than their experience of it. Does it mean that one of us is more right or more wrong or more harmed or less harmed? Not necessarily. It just means we have our individual experiences and our bodies respond to that in specific and particular ways. And so... I think that's really important then when we're talking about religious trauma that it's not necessarily the thing and or the thing could be messaging and practices and relationships often built on dynamics of power and control. And that can overwhelm our system so much that it does result in trauma or it does result in other mental health disorders or or physical disorders as well. Yeah, actually, what you're saying about those, the ways that it manifests, um, what are some of the ways that it manifests for someone who's maybe listening, Mm. thinking, oh, like, maybe I have experienced religious trauma, but I Mm -hmm. never really allowed myself to even consider that before. Like, what are some signs that maybe they could be looking for? Yeah. So again, I'm going to lean back on that religious trauma is trauma. I say that only because if you were to Google what are symptoms of religious trauma, it may not come up with much. But if you were to Google what are symptoms of trauma or PTSD or CPTSD, you would get a a longer list that is pretty Mm -hmm. accurate and applicable to religious trauma. Mm -hmm. So within that, I would say anything, um, it could be, you know, hypervigilance, it could be depression, anxiety, social phobias, relational issues, gastrointestinal issues, sexual dysfunction. There's a whole bunch of different symptoms that it could be. There's oftentimes a sense of hypervigilance as you're going about your day-to-day life where you might become triggered or startled very easily. It might be uh, tri- uh, being triggered like within the context of relationships or your day-to-day activities where you might have what we'd call like a confl- or an inflated or under I don't even know if that's a word, a uh, response to uh, what we might call a normal event. So, you know, something rather normal happens and we get really, really big and our response is maybe over the top or we get really tiny and we under respond to something that needs a bit more response. We see that happen a lot. We see, you know, people like even mentioning or thinking about past experiences within religion, or they might hear a a worship song when they go to Hobby Lobby or, you know, whatever it is. And all of a sudden their body tenses up. They might feel like they want to run away really quick, really quickly, or um, they might want to, they they feel like they're going to yell at somebody or they want to punch something. So we look at kind of these responses that are happening in everyday life that may not necessarily fit the situation that we're Mm -hmm. in. And that can sometimes be an indicator of trauma as well. You you use that term um, high control religion, and I think that's like an mm-hmm. acronym. I'm not sure if you coined the acronym this HCR high control religion, mm-hmm. um, yeah. but yeah, how did you decide to use that and specifically that? You know, there's a lot of characteristics of these religions that yeah. we could choose to label them by, but that you chose control mm-hmm. as as the label. Like, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I've been referring to high control religions as that for years at this point. Um, I wanted a term to um, kind of be like an umbrella term for our experiences. A lot of people don't resonate with the word abuse or like spiritual abuse. They really do conflate that with clergy sexual abuse and some of these bigger kind of more overt abuses. Um, But yet they're able to say, 
this experience for me or this teaching or this relationship really had an impact on me. I felt like I was being controlled. I felt like I didn't have a sense of autonomy. I felt like I was being micromanaged or I had to walk on eggshells. And they start to realize that their experience wasn't maybe typical of what we would call a healthy relationship. And and so I wanted to develop some some language that really kind of helped people organize what their experience was. Part of my own experience and research really stemmed from the work um, that I did personally and professionally within domestic violence. And I started to notice a lot of similarities between the dynamics of power and control inside a domestically violent relationship, as well as these what I now call high control religions. Um, And this could be a high control religion. It could be just fundamentalism in general, whether it's religious or not. Uh, Cults, you know, anything that kind of is, is falling under that umbrella. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it stemmed from that. And that allowed me to see how the dynamics of power and control worked within a relationship as well as a religion. How do people get into those systems or relationships? Why do they stay? How do they get out? And what are the impacts of them? So I found that the term really resonates with people because it it feels accurate without feeling jarring, if that makes hmm. sense. We just did an interview um, with David Fitch, and he was talking about how um, – the love of God is um, non-coercive. And that was kind of the basis of, mm. of his platform. Mm-hmm. And we ended up talking a lot about, is that really true? Because, or at least for anyone who holds any doctrine of hell or even annihilation, really anything mm-hmm. that's not universalism, at least this is what I was trying to say in the conversation. Mm-hmm. I was like, how can, if there's, if you have any belief other than universalism, how is that not coercive? So yeah, what what are your thoughts mm-hmm. on like, is it possible to hold a, a a Christian faith that does believe in any form of, of like hell and have that not be a high control religion? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say no. Um, and if we want to just take a step back, if we... Um, applied that same standard to a parent of a child, I think we would easily be able to say that's abusive, that's neglectful, that's terribly toxic or unhealthy when we're talking about that loving parent-child relationship. And so if that's the standard that we as humans are held to, why why would we expect anything less than that? Because from this God's point ways point. are higher than our ways, <laughs> I know, Laura. But what a power! <laughs> You'll play, never though, understand. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's coercion. That's a power play. That is right. that is the ultimate gaslighting, right? Yeah. And I don't use that word lightly. I, I'm very careful of how I use words like gaslighting and narcissism and things like that. But that idea of God's ways are are higher than ours ways or not our ways, or we won't understand, that is this really quote unquote nice statement to get away with shitty behavior yeah. and to really bypass pain and hurt and everything like that. And so I, I remember the first time I kind of sat with with that of like, yeah, if I had a child, I, I you know, or let, let's say I had three children or I was going to have three children. I, before they're born, am not going to decide, you know what? I think kid number two, I'm going to like love them less and probably try to make their life as harmful and painful as possible um, because I that's what they're predestined for. But the mm-hmm. other two kids, I'm going to treat much better. Like, Okay, obviously that is abusive and toxic and harmful, but that essentially is what God is doing when we have these um, doctrines of hell and predestination and all these concepts that we're naming as love and grace, but in a human context, that would never fly. So yeah, make that make sense. That's kind of my personal thought. Yeah, Yeah. and I think, I mean, I 100% agree with you. Um, and I, I think the, I call it the inner apologist, like this, mm. this inner voice from yes. our past that I think a lot mm-hmm. of our listeners probably have too, is saying, um, you know, it's not fair. Like we don't get to hold God to the same standards that we would hold mm. ourselves to. Like, yes, you're right. A sure. parent couldn't do that, but God mm-hmm. is God and he can do yeah. whatever he wants. 
Yeah. And I would say, why not? Why can't we? Like to have somebody that's above question, that's a huge power dynamic right there. So if God can't withstand being questioned about that and his only answer for it is my ways are higher than your ways, that's a problem, I think. (laughs) I think so too. Yeah, it, to, to all <laughs> yeah. to then to then also say that you're the god of love and you're the god of relationship and you want to have this personal relationship. Mm-hmm. If you were just like, there's this deity that like is uh, above us and you know it's like okay, I get you know in the same way that like mm-hmm. maybe there's aliens out there that are like watching us right now and like could squash us and <laughs> I, you know I read a lot of stuff. Okay, anyways, um, this is what I do after 11 p.m. at night. I go down these dark <laughs> holes of like, wait, are, are yeah. we alone? Anyway, um, yeah, but like. In if, but if you're saying like you're the god of relationship, you're the god of uh, you know of yeah, incarnation, and love yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then and, to say like, yeah. but but also like I'm also just like the same the god that you know the Israelites of the of the people around the Israel. I, I'm just like all the gods of all the other nations too, where it's like impersonal and a, you know when yeah. you start asking too many questions, <laughs> you can't have a you can't have both of those things. It feels like. Yeah, I would say not, and I think even if you were to compare. That version of God that we're talking about, right? That, you know, is there is the power dynamic, the the coercive dynamic. If you even compare that to say like the New Testament or how we are told to treat our neighbors or those who are in need or children or those who are helpless, like that doesn't match, right? So if, yeah. if we're using God's own word to determine how I should treat others, why why is God not able to meet that same standard that he created? That's usually where I would go with that. We talk a lot about the Bible on this show, probably Mm -hmm. more than anything else. And I mean, it's, it's interesting as we talk about this topic, because Mm -hmm. uh, in short, you can kind of make the Bible say anything. And there are passages that the passages that demonstrate, you know, this, god of love and these really Mm. beautiful teachings and then there's plenty of other passages that are horrific and teach the subjugation of women and you know the god's ways are higher than my ways that's a verse from the bible so like yeah what is your approach to the bible as someone who clearly doesn't place the bible above critique and allow you're allowing your own intuition Mm -hmm. and your gut and your body to also be Mm -hmm. an authority in your life Yeah. So I'll start off by saying I have read the Bible cover to cover over three dozen times. I am not somebody who like was a laissez-faire Christian who like referenced it, you know, like opened it and pointed and there's my word from God. I knew it like back to back. Um, And I've, I've done Bible classes and, you know, in terms of like history and original language and things like that. And so, you know, I think sometimes the more you get into that, the more you actually see that it is a book written by what, like 50 some authors that Mm -hmm. are each its own individual book that they're trying to put all together. But I think the position that I've adopted that feels the best to me is that um, I think the Bible, like any book, could have some really great things about it, some wisdom, um, some stories that could be interesting to listen to. But to suggest that that book or or my book is like infallible, that to me does not make sense anymore, in part because of the human experience. And it's interesting because I would really say that therapy changed my life. But I don't necessarily mean me as the client. I mean me as the therapist. When I started working with clients, I started to see that these boxes that I had been living out of did not match the human experience and in fact made the human experience, it vilified it and it made people evil. And I would watch people in my office. I remember I remember one gal who is really trying to pray the gay away. And and I watched her agonize and struggle and try to date men. And it just wasn't working. And I remember thinking, like, I'm watching her do all these things that she's quote unquote supposed to do in order to become straight. And, you know, either she is not straight, which she's not, or... Like God is 
a jackass because, mm. you know, like, why would he give her this struggle that literally cannot be prayed away? And she just has to struggle like that while the rest of us out there or straight folks or whatnot can just go on and love people and, and, and whatnot. And it was mm. just, it was those eye opening moments where I was like, wow, when we really look at the human experience, it just does not fit into a book. And then on a personal level, I remember the first time I was sexually active, I expected to feel immense guilt and shame. I was waiting for it. Like I didn't want to get out of bed the next morning because I was like, the moment my feet hit the ground, it will wash over me. Like I've been taught that it is going to. And when it didn't, and when I prayed to be convicted and I still didn't feel convicted, I had to grapple with that to be like, oh shit, if that wasn't true, if my actual embodied experience means anything, like that, that's a big deal. And it means I have to question everything else. And I did, <laughs> um, which is how I get to like right here. But I think that we, I, I personally believe that religion most specifically high control religion tries to grab hold of very essential core essence parts of who we are like gender sexuality control them so that they can control us and that just does not work for me anymore mm -hmm. <laughs> and partially why the bible doesn't work for me like that mm -hmm. anymore as infallible yeah, yeah. and Definitely. it doesn't claim to be infallible so that's an easy true easy there's answer. that other people claim it is, but it doesn't because it's not an it. But I could go on that rant for a long time. Yes, I get As it. As you said, yeah. it's, it's a collection of a whole bunch of texts. And of course, they mm -hmm. are not infallible. But that, what yes. you were saying is also maybe a great transition into the topic of purity culture, which is a, a big mm. one for you from what I was kind of seeing yeah. when I was looking at your, your resources and your posts. Um, and you mm. had this title that was, I kissed a lot of men, had my heart broken, and I'm ready for, more ready for a relationship because of it. <laughs> Um, yes. And I just, I thought that was um, perfect because it really calls out the fears that justify purity culture, which is that you're mm -hmm. going to have your heart broken. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, yeah, you're not going to be ready for um, a good relationship. And you're, yeah. so, so you're kind of pointing out that the flaws there, <clears throat> but I will mm -hmm. say yeah, as parents now, us, mm -hmm. us being parents, we are definitely wary of not wanting the pendulum swing too far away from purity culture to where we don't give any form of guidance mm -hmm. and safety and mm -hmm. wisdom, you know, to our kids. Yeah. So like what, where would you say is like this healthy mm -hmm. path f within purity to get away from purity culture, yeah. but still, yeah, I don't know. Tell us, give us your mm -hmm. thoughts on it all. Well, on the one hand, if we were to look at like a spectrum, right, or where we can have a pendulum swinging from side to side and we put purity culture on one side um, the opposite side of the spectrum, I don't necessarily think is that healthy either. It's dictated by still by other people or the opposite of what purity culture is. So instead of saying no, I will only say yes. Instead of saying this is bad, this is only good. And that's just as fundamentalist and potentially unhealthy as the other side. And so I think that we need to do the harder work of looking for a balance and that's going to look different for everybody because it means that we might take things from both sides and and add in some of our own stuff and learn and grow and things like that i think though anytime that we vilify our bodies our sexuality our desires our physiological cues and say that's bad and that's dirty it only produces shame and it oftentimes grooms us to be in situations where we do experience harm and greater pain and greater heartbreak. You know, one of the things that I like to talk about sexuality as like a dimmer switch on like a, you know, you've got the on off light switch and they've got the dimmer right. switch. We are born as sexual beings like that's inherent to who we are from the moment that we are born. And as we age you know like that little dimmer switch turns on little bit by little bit by little bit that's how our bodies are created so you're you know how you engage with your sexual self as a two-year-old is going to be exploration curiosity um whereas you know when you're maybe 13 14 years old you're looking at how does that work with other people um maybe pleasure is more involved in that and so we're slowly turning that on but all the while our body is like warming up 
right? And so we're not going from off, off, off to on, which to our body often feels very threatening and overwhelming, right? If I've been told to suppress everything for my entire life, and now because I said I do, and there's a piece of paper in place, now it's good. Our bodies don't work like that. Our bodies often then interpret that as too much, too soon, too fast, Mm -hmm. And we're overwhelmed, right? right? And so that's not what we want to do either. And so we want to encourage what would be like a healthy sexual development. What is appropriate for a five-year-old? The exploration piece, the playing doctor piece, like that's very normal exploration and how sexuality is expressed as a five, six, seven, eight-year-old. And as parents, how can we encourage that to say, yep, that's totally normal. And we also put guardrails around it, right? So it's like, hey, honey, I know you're like finding all these spots on your body that bring pleasure. But we're going to make sure that when we do that, it's at home, maybe not in public. Or you can go to your bedroom and explore that, but maybe not in the public spaces of our house where your siblings are running around. And so it's encouraging that their body is good and pleasure is good, but there's appropriate guardrails around it. And so we're not shaming them. We're simply helping them find the best spaces for them to explore that. The other thing with that is, you know, purity culture is was originally, I mean, purity culture as we know it today. So talking about like true love weights starting back in 1993. If you, if you pull open the book of I Kiss Dating Goodbye, you know, one of the things that Josh talks about is this is the way that you escape heartbreak and pain and, you know, then you're not practicing for divorce. When in reality, that's bypassing a lot of human experiences that are necessary, right? When I'm 19 and I experience a heartbreak, that is the worst pain that I have ever felt in my life. And it's good for me to work through that, right? Because now my like window of tolerance and experience has expanded a little bit. And then when I get my heart broken again, it expands a little bit more and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And so now at almost 42, I look back at my 19 year old self and I can acknowledge like, yep, that was really painful. And I've experienced things that have been far more painful, but it doesn't negate that pain. And so as we're, if we can lean into that rather than just simply trying to avoid it, we're actually doing ourselves a favor in a relational sense. We, we know the things that are important to us, what matters, what our desires are, what our likes are, what we don't like. And that is all very, very important. And those are the things that help us develop our identity, our boundaries, our sexual ethic, how we interact with people. That's what keeps us from getting into situations that actually could cause even more physical and or sexual harm and danger. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good point um, of just how, you know, why, why is the number one goal to like avoid heartbreak or to avoid pain? Yeah. Like, sure. I mean, yeah, you know, we may, maybe aren't going to just want someone to walk right into heartbreak, but that shouldn't be right. the goal to the mm-hmm. point that you're yeah. controlling other parts of, of your life. And yeah. The other aspect being that it's like preparing you for divorce or something like both of those are just yeah. really backfire because if, you know, if yeah. the dream um, solution to it all is just you wait long enough that you happen to get in the perfect relationship and then boom, you get married. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you're actually, I don't know what the statistics say, but it seems like you'd be almost more likely to end up in, in a mm-hmm. divorce situation because you are, you yeah. probably feel pressure to marry that mm-hmm. person. I mean, we've, you know, yeah. anyone who's processed purity culture has talked about this before, mm-hmm. but the, the pressure mm-hmm. of being in a relationship is so high because breaking mm-hmm. up is considered like a mini divorce that yes. then you feel that pressure to, to just marry mm-hmm. the person because you're already this yeah. far. And then, yeah, how does yeah. that set you up for success? Well, the other piece to that too is within that context, not only are we, we uh, dating or rather courting with this like very specific prescription and goal like there's also so much that you are suppressing at the same time so I'm dating this person and in some cases I mean the way I grew up it's like you had to know even before the first date if you were going to marry this person you were seeking the wise counsel you were you know all these things that were supposed to further guard your heart and help protect you from being heartbroken but When we do that, we are completely disconnected from our own body 
we're completely reliant on what the outside says. So my pastors, my parents, my mentors, spiritual authorities, books, you know, things like that. And and on top of that, we're not allowed to do certain things, anything physical. We're not allowed to talk about certain topics. In a lot of and so, a lot of cases, you're not even allowed to be alone together. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so then you're now you're married and you're with this person who you don't know, right? And talk about setting that setting them up for divorce. That's setting them up for divorce. To now be in this marriage that they technically are not supposed to be able to get out of this is lifelong god ordained so huge sin to get out of it but i don't actually know the person who's in front of me i don't know the person i'm loving i don't know what their likes and dislikes are i don't know what their morning routine is i don't know like if they know even know anything about their body or sex or how to please me or themselves or anything like that that's the setup for divorce and certainly i'm not saying just go you know do whatever without any forethought wisdom you know whatever but those experiences that we have where we're learning how to relate to one another to have deep conversations to risk vulnerability to um practice you know interaction conflict resolution waking up in the morning with somebody and being like oh yeah you are not the person from last night and we got to figure out how to deal with that those are actually the things i believe that strengthen in our ability to have relationships and to to have a more accurate view of what they are and i would say in fact that that probably decreases the risk of divorce rather than what purity culture promises hmm. on purity culture too you had a post about um that was comparing purity culture with the tv show love is blind um, <laughs> yes i thought that was a really fascinating comparison Co. so can you kind of explain yeah. that to us yeah, so in that article, I, I do I do a, a sub stack. It's called Therapy in the Headlines. And so I take various things that are going on pretty much in like pop culture and talk about it from a therapeutic uh, language or angle as well as incorporate my own story into it. And so I, I had actually been tagged in a post which got my wheels turning about this. And, and I was just looking at like, we have this show, Love is Blind, which I mean... I'm going to watch every episode, let's be real, um, <laughs> because it's great reality TV. But there's this pinnacle of of getting to see the other person. You build this super deep emotional connection, and then the whole goal is get to the reveal and then get to the altar, right? But you don't actually know this person, right? You might have had many, many deep conversations but you don't know the day-to-day -day activities. You've not spent enough time with them to develop trust, but they're really promoting that if you can just form this emotional connection, then we're good. Like the marriage is, it's gonna be there and successful. And that reminds me so much of purity culture maybe not the emotional connection, but the spiritual connection. So we just build this spiritual connection and we rush to the altar as fast as we can. And then we're like, oh no, I don't know this person. I don't know the intricacies of who they are. I've built this this spiritual connection with them, but I know nothing else. And so I think there's other similarities between purity culture and love is blind, um, like with the undertones and you know, just even like the whole marriage is the pinnacle of all relationships. Mm -hmm. That's there too. But that was kind of the angle that I took. And you know, as much as we like to say purity culture is this evangelical religious thing, we find it in our culture all over the place. Mm. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. Um, I think, especially because from the you know maybe extreme the I kiss dating goodbye culture, mm -hmm. almost the ideal would be to not even see the person until you know you're committed yes. to them because because you're suppressing sexuality. And so, mm -hmm. you know, what is, what's even the point? Like, shouldn't you be basing it on other factors? Which, which reminds me of when I was in, in college and hadn't ever dated anyone. And there was um, someone who basically asked me, well, it was, it was pretty, it was a Christian university. So let's say rather than asking me out for lunch, it was basically like, would you like to be in a serious relationship and potentially move yeah. on <laughs> with me? Um, but move overseas. So, <laughs> we were Translate the Bible. 
Oh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Which, oh, you know, in so that funny. context, you're like, if I don't say yes to this person, I'm probably never going to find someone else who wants to move to Tibet, you know? So yeah. It yeah. Was, there's a lot of pressure, <laughs> high stakes. Um, yeah. But yeah. I remember, like, I literally made this, you know, pros and cons list in my mind and, and had all the, like this guy just checked off every box of all the things yeah. that I've been looking for. I mean, obviously, yeah. Willing to move to Tibet, pretty big one. And, <laughs> um, yes. And you know, it was this great person. Everyone loved them. Like I had total respect for them. Great friend. Mm -hmm. And I remember I went to some of my closest friends and I was processing it all. And, and they just asked like, so are you attracted to them? And I was like, mm. oh, I don't think so. And they're yeah. like, why is that not on your list of criteria? And I was like, yeah. Oh my gosh, I was just, I'd never even thought of it before, which now is, such an mm -hmm. obvious, um, uh, obvious criteria, but that just totally takes, takes me back to the love is blind topic. Cause yeah. I think, I think I was trying to live that way, trying yeah. to, I felt like I shouldn't be like acknowledging how I feel physically about right. someone. So, and that was actually part of the article that I wrote too. I shared an experience of, uh, being courted by this person who on paper was like the perfect match for me um, and wanted the same things. And so spiritually we were good and all of the, you know, spiritual authorities around us were really championing this relationship. But I, I was not attracted to him physically. And I really wasn't attracted to his personality. He was a wonderful person. And, and I'm sure if I was still in that community, I'd probably be friends with him. But it wasn't the type of person I was looking for. And I knew that. And my body knew that. Was trying to like scream at me, please do not do this. And I I don't know what boldness I had, but I listened to my body. And I said, mm -hmm. I, I cannot do this. And I was very much um, questioned. People doubted my faith. I He had this long sit down where he wrote this like seven page letter and then read it to me Gosh. talking about, oh, you know, really like questioning my faith and how, you know, I am definitely not pursuing being a biblical woman because, oh, no. you know, these other things aren't as important to me. And, um, and I remember feeling terrible and begging God to please just make me attracted to this person because he is the quote unquote right person that I'm supposed to be dating according to the spiritual leaders and this list of criteria that I had. And I, and in my mind, physical attraction didn't matter because if God wanted us to be together, then that would grow. Mm -hmm. And, and I really, really thought that. And um, I'm so glad my body spoke up and that I was such a rebel to listen to her. Um, but I, I know that that experience is very true for a lot of people. Like that, that's a very similar or a very common experience that people have had. Wow. That's, that's a crazy story. Yeah. <laughs> Can I do uh, a few listener questions? Can we yeah, get into absolutely. some of those? Okay. Uh, so this will take us anywhere. I don't know where these are going to take us. So probably <laughs> shifting topics. So um, Colin says, I have yet to hear someone share a story of trauma from a church where once it was brought up, the church acknowledged and corrected it. Mm. They usually just cause more damage in trying to protect themselves and drive the person further away. Do you know of any examples of churches that have actually sided with the wounded, even though it meant turning a spotlight on their own abuse? And how can those of us who have had adverse re religious experiences express them to people still in those churches in a way that lets them see us and are hurt and not think that we're attacking what they hold dear. Mm, that's a few a questions question. there. Yeah. 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 So, um, I know there are churches that have done this, that have recognized, uh, we've got to implement harm reduction, uh, skills and patterns. We do need to listen to survivors. We need to take an internal look at our systems and what we're built on. Those aren't the stories that most people feature though. Yeah. Um, what I am reminded of is, uh, and this might sound like a really b bizarre uh, person to go to, um, but for those people who grew up in purity culture and are familiar with the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, the author, Josh Harris, um, is a friend. And the 
the reason he left the church was because of just that, where he started hearing people's stories and wanted to be able to shine a light on it and do the examination and was actually blocked by other senior leaders and uh, of the church. And that is ultimately the, one of the things that pushed him out the door. And I do know of many, many other former pastors where that was the case, where they truly did desire for that but they were just blocked because of th that would mean having to take a really difficult look and change a lot of things. I think part of the reason why it doesn't tend to happen that way is that a church is an institution. It is a system. And those are not built for the individual person. They are created in such a way where their goal is to uphold the institution or the system. And so while we can see, hey, this actually would make things better, it would actually have to tear it down first, right? We have to go back down to the foundation or the studs and really build up from that place. And that takes time. It takes humility. It takes effort and intention. It oftentimes takes money and resources. It's not flashy. It's very difficult. And there's a lot of churches that would say, you know what? Either we don't want to do that or let's just pretend that didn't happen and start new this way. But the roots are already rotten. And so it's very hard to continue forward with that. So I do want to leave space that there are churches that are making amends. There are churches that have are very open. I, I can think of even churches here in Nashville, where I'm from, uh, Josh Scott's church, Grace Point. I look at the things that they're doing with their, within the community and their members, and they're fully open to taking ownership and to course correcting when needed. And I do think that there's many churches like that, but I think the mo the majority of churches are more falling on that protect us at all costs. Um, and truly we're seeing people that are like even pastors that are pushing back. And that's why I brought the Josh Harris thing up. Pastors that are pushing back are just being asked to leave or being booted out of those communities. Yeah. And there's this excuse made, um, from, I don't know if it's from the pulpit or within, you know, senior staff meetings or whatever that, that they have to protect the name of Jesus by doing that, Yes, which is yes. so counter um, reality, because in reality, they're just um, making the name of Jesus even more, you know, horrible yeah. by protecting yeah. practices like that. Well, and I would say they're protecting the name of Jesus that they have decided is the yeah. name yeah. of Jesus. Right. So they go, this is who we think Jesus is. I think about a lot of churches that are now very interwoven with like Christian nationalism and they go, our politics and our religion go hand in hand and they've created a Jesus, a savior figure that matches that. And that's who they protect. But if you were to actually look at the Bible and the example that we're given there, we see two very different people. And so I think that's an important piece too, protecting which Jesus, like which one are we yeah. talking about here? Is it the one that the Bible is describing or is it the one that you have created or the church has created or the country has created to fit their needs so that mm. they have permission to do whatever they want? Yeah. yeah. Kara asks, uh, and, and if anyone's listening, if you are a supporter of the show, um, all, all over our website, almostheretical.com, you can ask questions of guests that come on the show. We'd love to hear those, those questions, so um, you'll find out more there. Kara asks, I'm curious to hear more about differing Christian views of mental health and how this plays into, uh, how this plays into it, i.e. your heart is deceitful and can't be trusted, that kind of teaching. How do religious beliefs feed into religious trauma? How can churches continue to allow abuse yet seem exempt from being held accountable for this abuse? How can churches prevent this mm -hmm. from happening? Yeah. Oh, those are big questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think overall there is a pretty, um, like they like to keep therapy, psychology kind of at arm's length. Um, that's thought of to be, you know, either of the devil or woo woo or something that at the very least could really pull you away from your relationship with God. Um, obviously I don't think that's the case. Right. Um, I think there's a fear there that what therapy actually does is invite you into a relationship with yourself. And what happens then is that you might see something very different than what you're being taught. And so 
that might mean questions or doubts or deconstruction or deconversion or dealing dealing and healing with religious trauma or maybe talking to friends that it doesn't always leave room for the church to just have the amount of control that they have had in the past and and so in an insulated system whether that's a church or a cult or a family system they vilify this thing therapy and then when the thing happens when the person gets their own voice or starts exploring they go see we knew this was going to happen. This is an evil thing. So they, they've, they it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And that then further kind of like solidifies the position that they had in the first place. Um, the other thing is that in these systems, they create a lot of problems that only they can fix. And so it keeps you insulated and only looking within the system for answers. When we look outside, when we go to therapy or work with a mentor or a coach or something like that, we do start to see other things that doesn't fit under the umbrella of what they're teaching. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know there was other questions there. No, that's good. So, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious yeah. as we, as we kind of come towards the end here, but like, I don't, I don't like this timestamp our interviews. I like to let, let it be evergreen. Right. But we are in, it's 2024. We're gearing up for the election again. It feels like we just did the, this exact same election. <laughs> um, I know. I and know. probably this is going to be pretty evergreen anyway, because in two years or four years or whenever someone's listening to this, they're going to be like, well, we're doing the exact same thing again. It's the same stuff. But I'm curious how, the, talking about this election cycle, I mean, we started this show back in, started recording in 2017, largely because of like, Gosh, yeah. like all the stuff we were feeling, other people were feeling because of the 81% that voted for Donald Trump, 81% of evangelical yeah. Christians that voted for Donald mm-hmm. Trump. Everyone's familiar with that number. And just a lot of stuff yeah. started changing right around there. It's like, well, I don't want to be that kind of Christian or am I a Christian? Like mm-hmm. so many people were asking those kind of questions. And now it feels yeah. like it's it's triggering, right? We're doing this all again. And yeah. I think likely yeah. Trump will be our president. Someone listening to this in the future, you know the answer already. Um, yeah, true. You know, the polls are showing like this. So it just feels really triggering. I'm guessing a lot of people out there are like, are we doing this again? Like, is the church going to vote differently? Like, yeah, I'm just curious how you think about all this as this election cycle um, comes upon us and with religious trauma in mind. Like, yeah, just give us give us some guidance here. Well, and for listeners, this maybe sounds a little out of the blue, like, well, why are we just talking about election cycles? But you offer a course literally called yeah. Religious Trauma yeah. and Election Cycles. So so yeah. we bring this up because this is a combination that you've already made. So, yeah, yeah just wanted yeah. to mm-hmm. lay that out there, that this is something you've already connected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gosh, I wish I had like a simple answer of like, here's what's happening or here's what's going to happen. I am getting text messages, emails, DMs daily saying I'm so scared for what is happening. You know, we're we're in the beginning half of the year. The election is still months and months away. And yet what we're seeing is terrifying, right? Like it it, it feels unimaginable. It feels like in, in a grand scale, it's like, is this the last election we're ever going to have? You know, on a micro scale, it's a little bit more like, are we doing this again? You know, we yeah. just did this and it doesn't, it, it feels like can't we should see have it going longer. any better. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and I think with that though, there is a sense of usually like hopelessness and helplessness, right? I'm one small person with one vote. Like, what is that going to do? Or does it matter? Or these other people and voices are so much louder with so much more power and money and resources. And it does feel overwhelming and traumatizing or re-traumatizing sometimes and triggering. Um, And I think when we're coming out of a background of high control religion, fundamentalism, cults, it hits really close to home for some very obvious reasons. We talked a little bit earlier about Christian nationalism. We're seeing this huge marriage between religion and politics, and that can feel really sticky for a lot of reasons, but least of which is like, I left that. (laughs) Like I, I left that system and now that system is trickling into mainstream culture and politics. Side Mm. note, it has been for a very, very long time, many decades, but now we're seeing it in a very overt way. And so that can feel triggering, but we're also seeing that it it really hits on a relational level, uh, on a day-to-day level. There's many people that wonder because I'm a certain gender or sexuality like 
Do my rights matter? Are those mm. going to be taken away from me? We see a lot of families and friendships that are, are dividing and disconnecting because they believe this and I believe this, which means we don't have common ground anymore. And so literally moving to other this. places sometimes <laughs> like that's yes. a big thing. I don't know if that's happening where you are, too, but like we can't live oh, here anymore. Yeah. We are moving here. So you're not just like we don't talk to each other when we get together, but like you're not even around each other anymore. I mean, this is this is big. <laughs> yeah, I I live in nashville tennessee like right outside the the city um so i'm in a very very uh red county that is filled with people from california new york and illinois who have all moved here yeah. because we of our governor and the laws that we are passing meanwhile i'm like i think i'd like to move somewhere else because i i it's not that i don't think my voice doesn't matter i do but it's very hard to live in a state where my rights are continuously being taken away as a woman, mm -hmm. right? I don't have autonomy over my body anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have certain choices available to me. That's really scary. So I get why people sometimes yeah. move away. Um, it, yeah, that it is tricky, but, but we're seeing it. We're, right. we're absolutely see yeah i'm not it. even trying to make a judgment call just saying like it's crazy yeah. that we're living in a time now where i mean people yes. are actually dividing up and moving to different spots. i'm like play this out like how does this go <laughs> like i just yeah. when i think of the country and where we are it's just and you're right like there's a lot of trauma that goes along with this for people i'm yeah. sure too and yeah it's just crazy and there's a yeah a, when i was looking at the course that you offer on religious trauma and election cycles one of the points in there is dealing with um, having conversations and relationships with people yeah. that you disagree with, yeah. which I think is yeah. so important. And I mean, the mm -hmm. polarization of our culture is gonna be its downfall. Yes. I can't see any other mm -hmm. way. Um, so yeah. yeah, how do you maneuver that in, in a way that you know values the fact that we're gonna have differences and we have to yeah. be able to be in relationships, but also I'm sure mm -hmm. still emphasizes that sometimes things are triggering or yeah. unhealthy and like, how do you maneuver that? Yeah. When do you push through when yeah. you get out? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that fundamentalism teaches us, and I'm not even just talking about religious fundamentalism, this could be wellness culture, this could be some sort of political extremism, or maybe not even extremism. Um, but we have this view that difference equals danger. So if you have a different opinion or lifestyle or make different choices, that means that you are diff different and dangerous than me. And um, I think the way our culture and social media and, and just access to people that has played into like heightening that sense of danger. Um, but that means then if, if we are say voting for two different political candidates and we come to a coffee meeting, our guards are already going to be up because yeah. I believe you're dangerous and you believe I'm dangerous. Yeah. And so that means that everything that we are hearing from the other person is filtered through a very specific lens where that might trigger us. We might become accusatory. We might try to fight with someone. We might ice them out, isolate, run away. And so that unto itself does not bode well for relationships. So when we look at like, how do we even interact with people that are different than us? I think there's a self component and then an, uh, like a, a relational component. The self component is needing to learn how do I learn to regulate my own nervous system and find safety within myself so that regardless of what's going on around me, I can have a sense of my own internal stability and safety. That's easier said than done, but part, that's part of what I teach in the course mm. is how, we, how to develop some of these skills and tools. And then the other piece is relational in the sense that we may need to start engaging in conversations with people that start off with boundaries, that start off with saying like, hey, I want a relationship with you. I realize that these parts of our lives don't mesh and perhaps that doesn't need to be a part of our relationship. Can we move forward? And we talk about sports or we talk about these activities or we go do these things together. We don't talk about those. And then there's other relationships where we need to take a hard look and go, wow, you are like preaching against my existence. Like I don't feel safe. Like every time I'm with you, you're coming at me or you're not able to regulate yourself in such a way that it actually like 
I become the victim of your danger and vitriol. And that's where we would need to look at putting up some boundaries, maybe distancing ourselves a little bit, especially if the other person can't kind of get themselves together. Mm -hmm. Um, It is a two way street for sure, but it takes a lot of practice. Yeah. yeah, it takes a lot of practice and both people or peoples like, you know, there can be more than two willing to say, hey, I'm going to value you as a person over a doctrine or a theological stance or a political stance or some sort of ideology. I see you as a person yeah. over all of those things. One of my dearest or longest girl, like longest friend, one of my good girlfriends, um, we are very different on almost every topic uh, that we could ever come up with. And we've been friends now for almost 14 years. Mm-hmm. And um, we have figured out that we value each other more than how the other person votes or advocates or believes or whatnot. And so we can still talk to each other about that. My response to her is simply just nodding and smiling. And yeah, I can see why you believe that. Because the thing is, is that if I put myself in her shoes, I absolutely can see why she believes that. Mm -hmm. And she can do the same for me. That's a compassionate way to interact with one another because we value the other person as a person, as a human. That's not accessible to everybody. And it's taken a lot of work to get there. But that is possible. Um, So that's the practice piece. Awesome. Yeah. No, I think it's really helpful. And the work you're doing is so valuable. Um, and I've just, Thank I've you. loved this. It's Dr. Laura Anderson. That's Anderson with an O and Dr. Just yes. DR. So DR, Laura yes. Actually, it's Dr. Laura E. Anderson.com. I oh, always have to it? specify that. Yes, I know. Because Dr. Laura oh, Anderson was taken. So yeah. DR. Okay. I even Laura misread that. E. Anderson. Okay. <laughs> It'll, and the link will be in the show notes. Um, and, yeah. And uh, I've just, I've loved this conversation. Shelby and I are going to keep talking listeners out there. We're going to keep talking. That recording is going to be available on our second podcast called utterly heretical, which uh, (laughs) we're going to keep talking about this topic and um, just how this conversation has hit us. So we'd love to have you join us over there. And Laura, thank you so much for joining us and coming on and and having, I think these really, really helpful conversations for people and you're doing great work. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for giving me a platform to talk. I appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Really grateful for everything that you're doing.